I'm pumped, man. Brandon Turner. Hey, buddy. Dude, Dude yeah. this is awesome. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. Dude, pumped. thank you for coming on, man. I am pumped. You are my favorite one third of a triathlon runner that I know. <laughs> Oh, good. Yeah. You know, it was tough work, but somebody had to run the or swim the whole 1.2 miles and I struggled through it. I got a whole lot of lessons there, but the ultimate, the end is I, I completed it and I didn't die. And that's, what's important in life is that we don't die. One extra day, man. One extra, <laughs> One extra day. day. He- Heather, Heather is pumped. Rosie Water are mm. pumped. Uh, but oh, I was yes. messaging back and forth with Ryan and he posted the picture of you with the swim cap on. And oh, I was yeah. like, that's a like, caption. Oh, I heard you didn't sign renew for your bigger pockets pro membership. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I so love I it. actually, I actually want to before we get into all the wonderful world of you, uh, for people listening, this is Brandon. it is a wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, world. It's, it's fantastic. We are not gonna get into your backstory. I love you, buddy. Um, oh, if you guys want to listen to Brandon's backstory, there's I was born like, on a dark and stormy night. There's like 10 five. There's like 10,000 hours of Brandon Turner live and yeah. in color documented across this entire mm-hmm. journey. So we're going to get into the meat and potatoes today. All right, man. Uh, first thing I want to ask you about, man, I, I was very happy to see that you went international with the family. That's freaking sweet. I did. That's not I something did. that you normally do. Talk about that. Yeah. Spent a year and a half in North Korea. No, we didn't. <laughs> we went over to uh, uh, just Russia. Wh- yeah, yeah, we just wanted to go see Russia and Ukraine for a little while. It was a great trip, uh, lots of memories. No, we went uh, on a road trip around the country. All right, so I stepped down from the podcast, uh, Bigger Pockets, back in December with my last episode. So then January on, I was, uh, I had the freedom to kind of do what I wanted to. I mean, I love Bigger Pockets, I still do, and I'm actually back on their show this week. Uh, but I didn't like having to do it every single week, right? It was just like it was like my identity, and I had to do it. So I was like, all right. I need a break. I need to step aside. And then open door capital. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. It's been just killing it. And I'm like, I need to focus energy there for a while. So anyway, took some time off. And then I was like, well, what, I, you know, why don't I get on the road and go, since I don't have to do a podcast anymore, I want to go see the country. So I went inside the country. Uh, and then uh, we had some car trouble issues uh, halfway through it. And so we're like, well, we got to wait three weeks for a part to come in. Why don't we go to Europe? So yeah, we went over to Europe, went to Barcelona and then Paris and then London and then ended in Scotland. And it was uh, it was difficult with kids, but it was amazing. Yeah. But yeah, travel, especially international travel with little kids. Oof. It is yeah. a uh, his adventure. It's a task, man. But I was I was really yeah. happy to see you do that, man, because you know you, you don't take time for you for you. It's, you know, uh, it's it's important to do so. But yeah, it's easy to get caught up. You know, the whole world of like, we want to get into real estate for financial freedom so we can do whatever we want. And then we get that and then we end up no, like <laughs> yeah, working, working 90 hours a week. And like, yeah. it's no different. Right. So like, unless you make an intentional point, like I'm going to take time off uh, and, and add those areas of margin or of a rest in my life, people don't do it. I love the concept of margin. And I also like the concept of like digestion, right? Because yeah. like we go through different seasons in life and we go through just like you listen to a podcast and then everyone's yeah. default is to move to the next podcast, to the next podcast, yes. to the next podcast. You don't yeah. take that time to drive and let it simmer. It's so you know true. I mean? It's so true. Yeah. So, uh, man, so that's actually one of the things I want to hit on about is with you, you have great monetary success. You've got great family success. Like you've got this, you've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. You've impacted millions of lives and all of this stuff. And it's all very impressive. And you put it on paper and you're like, holy crap, look at this guy. The thing that impresses me the most about you, man, is not any of that, ironically, but the fact that you were on a webinar every single week like clockwork <laughs> teaching beginner level real estate like how you do one thing is how you do everything can you like what kept you going because as you were rising up and as you were blowing up and you had all this following and you're doing bigger and bigger things progressively that was one thing that you kept doing like clockwork and you don't see that yeah. anymore can you speak on that a little bit yeah, man. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. And I, I, not just to pat myself on the back, but to, to just talk about like success in general, what I what I haven't see is like a lot of people think success is like this event. It, it's like, you know, oh, I won the contest. I won the trophy. I got the girl. I, you know, got the contract or the, the, the whatever, like the deal. Everyone like sees it as like the event. In reality, success is just like a whole lot of very mon- fairly mundane actions taken in rhythm. I love the idea of a rhythm, right? Like just over and over and over like a drumbeat. Uh, and an example that be like in my company, Open Door Capital, we want to buy a bunch of real estate deals. So like we have a, a rule, like we make 75 offers a quarter. 
75 offers a quarter, 75 offers a quarter. It's basically one a day. It works out to almost uh, when you figure out like weekends and such. 75 offers a quarter. And we just do it. It just, it's not always fun. To anal- and in, in order to make an offer, of course, we got to analyze probably 10 deals. Mm-hmm. So it's just like analyze, 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 offer, right? So like there's this rhythm to success and, and, and to build anything that most people don't see. It's kind of like uh, a magician, you know, you go to a magic show and you see the magician do the trick. You don't see the 10,000 times they practice that trick and they were bored to death the entire time. So the webinar that I taught for bigger pockets was in a large part that way. That was the thing that I could just do over and over and over and over. And A, I love teaching new investors how to get started. I love, like, I never get bored, get like talking people through how to buy a duplex. Like, it's always fun. And I'm like, no, and then you can get, you could rent out the other unit and live in one and live for free. And it's amazing. <laughs> and like, I get pumped up just talking about it. So it, one, it, one, it's fun. Number two, when you talk over and over and over and over about a subject, you start like finding your voice in it. And, and I, so I, mm. I crafted like most of my speeches and my later books and, and, and all that off of the things that I would teach on that daily web or the weekly webinar. And so uh, the questions that would come in, that was all uh, useful as well. And then of course I would record it and I could then take the clips later and throw them on social media. So there's a little bit of like, uh, you know, two birds with one stone aspect. Uh, but really, I mean, and then at the end of the day, the webinar at the end of it, it was an hour of education. And then, you know, 15 minutes of me talking about the bigger pockets pro membership. Mm-hmm. The membership is where bigger pockets makes most of its money from. And so, and, and at the end of the day, it's like, if I just do that every single week and I get better every single week at selling a pro membership over time, income goes up. And then the fact that we do it every single solitary week, there's a new group of people every week. And that is what made bigger pockets just tens of millions of dollars over the years of, uh, of just week after week after week. And some, I mean, so many entrepreneurs will go and do a webinar right? Mm-hmm. They'll do a webinar. They will do a yeah. raise for a deal. They will go make an offer, but it's the rhythm that, uh, where the magic is found. I love that, man. And also I'm noticing too, as I'm like on this journey, like creeping up on one year now, I've realized that as you learn things and then you teach things, you retain them better. Yes. hundred percent. And then you, and then you sharpen and you get better and you sharpen, yeah. you articulate, you get better. And then all of a sudden you got a newsletter. And now not only are you doing the interviews and you're asking interesting like entrepreneurs that are successful and free, now not only are you learning from them, but then you're taking everything that they're saying and you're like, okay, how do I chop this up and describe this in five minutes? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. You just refine your skills over and over and over. So when people are like, wow, uh, like, okay, I heard somebody yesterday, uh, I went to a dinner and had a, a woman cook who was a really good cook. And then I heard one of the other guests at the dinner say, man, she's such an amazing cook. I just don't have that gift. And it was, it's Uh-oh. almost like, I'm like, it's almost insulting. Cause I know the lady who cooked it yeah. what has worked thousands and of thousands hours. of hours to get good at cooking. Right. But it's like, that's the approach we all take is like, I just don't have that gift. So when people say that I'm good at talking on stage or I'm good at writing a book or whatever that thing that I happen to be good at doing is I'm like, yeah, you, you get good after 500 episodes of a podcast over 10 years or over yeah. 500 webinars over the course of 10 years, like you get, you get better. And so, yeah, my encouragement, anybody listening, to this is anytime you're tempted to say like, must be nice to be good at that. Or while wow, they were born with that, just know that it's almost never the case. It's always just years and years and years and years of practice. And that's what gives you the results. Exactly. And I want to hit on something that you just mentioned a little bit uh, briefly before and that is, you know, you you hit financial freedom and then yeah. you're working 90 hours a week. Yeah. So what's what's cool about that is you and you're one of the contributors right to this where everyone's like, OK, cool. Like, And the, it seems to me to be the default of ten thousand ten thousand dollars a month. That's what everyone yeah. says. No yeah. matter where yeah. like oh, yeah. ten thousand dollars a month in real estate so I can go yep. folks of real estate full time. Yeah. <laughs> And so you and Bigger Pockets and that whole community is what what launched this. And now here we are where people are either getting closer or hitting that mark. And now they've realized that they've done none of the mindset work, none yeah. of the vision work to know what the heck they want to do and who the heck they are when they don't have that thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it's so true. How was how was that for you, especially post Bigger Pockets? Yeah, I mean, the number of people that I know who have achieved financial independence and financial freedom and wealth or sold some company for millions of dollars or tens of millions or hundreds of millions and then are just stuck. It's, it's staggering. Like they just, they don't know what to do with themselves. Most, and most, most, yeah. Most people are that way. Most athletes, most celebrities, when they get done with whatever. And I think a huge piece of that 
is that their identity has been wrapped up in that thing. Like they are the guy from that company, right? So I had to tear before I did kind of the work ahead of time. I knew that my time at BP was winding down. And so I worked for several months, uh, maybe even several years, you could say, on tearing away my identity. I mean, really, if you go back, I started Open Door Capital four and a half years ago. That was an initial tearing away of Brandon's the bigger pockets guy. I didn't want to be the bigger pockets guy. Uh, and I mean, this is where like my entire company started because I was on stage at this conference of like really high level, uh, like real estate, like developers and syndicators, like really like multimillionaire millionaires and all this. I was on stage at this conference and I looked out there and I was like, I, I'm the least qualified person in this room to be on stage. I'm mm-hmm. here because I have a big mouth and a big platform and I could sell tickets. I don't deserve to be here. And so like, I swore like to myself that day, like I was going to deserve to be on that stage. I was going to be there because I, not because I had, could sell tickets, but because I could like, I deserve to be there. I was good enough to be there. Uh, and so that was kind of the initial, I guess you could say the tearing away of that identity. If I'm not just the bigger pockets guy. So if anybody, yeah work on that. Like who, what is your identity really? Like, I don't want to be the open door capital guy either. Right. Like uh, what exactly is that identity? And you know, only you can, only you can say that and it shifts constantly, but I want to know that if I lost open door capital today entirely and bigger pockets went away entirely in my real estate education and my niche famous life, right? Like quote unquote niche famous, which like means I can go to an event and people know me like if that all went away, who am I? Am I still like, yeah, I'm totally comfortable with myself. Like that's where I want to be. And I'm not, I'm not perfectly there yet, but uh, I definitely had pulled away and I kind of tore that identity from bigger pockets before making the leap. Uh, and and I, I want my identity to be like, you know, I'm a family guy. Like I'm a dad, yeah. I'm a husband. Like that's, that's doesn't go away. So that's yeah. important. I love that. And we'll get a little bit into ter- tearing identity and mindset shifts and the whole relationship that you have with uh, Jason Drees, because yeah. I, part, I, I coach with him too. Oh, so, nice. Yep. Yeah. I, so my, my MO is I'm just like, what does the six foot six Hawaiian dude do? And I just do that. So I don't, there you I don't go. try That's to all you gotta do. invent the wheel. So I was like, okay, Jason's real estate, <laughs> real estate check. There you save go. That's it, all you do, man. Money. I was like, okay, I'm going to start a text letter, start a newsletter, start a podcast. Yeah. There you go. So just follow that guy. Um, that, and what's funny though, is like, you know, you joke about it, but in reality, there's so much works. value, it right? Works. It works. Yeah, just find out. Like, I don't like I copy everything. Like my entire like open door capital was copied because I saw what Grant Cardone was doing. I was like, wait, right. He's building a a social media following. But rather than selling like hair care and makeup products like every other influencer, he's like, I'm going to go raise money. And I was like, that's genius. So I just did the same thing. Right. Awesome, yeah. Grant. <laughs> I try. I try. Right. Well, that's what's the idea, right? You go, okay, I like what they're doing. I'm going to take that aspect. How do I improve upon it or, or add my own twist to it? So when people see Grant, they see the private jet and they see like that yeah. kind of like make more money, money, money. What I want when people see me, I like, I want like these words to come to their mind. Like, Hey, I like that guy. Like, that's what I want my mm. brand to be is like, Hey, I like that guy. Like, I don't think Grant cares if people like him or not. He, in fact, he said yeah. on our podcast, when we interviewed him. He's like, you can get half the world to hate you and become president. He's like, I don't yeah. want people you know, who like me. I don't, he's like, I don't want to be happy. I want to be, no, I want to be happy. I, I like, anyway, so it's like, you look what works for them, take what works, add your own twist to it and build your own identity off of that. It's a, it's a powerful thing. Yeah. You're like, if Grant Cardone went to youth group a little bit more when he was growing up. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's funny. I was actually, I was a youth. I don't know. Wasn't a, I was an you ordained. A, I, was a, I was a youth a, leader yeah, I was for to say, a long a time. I did. I was a junior high youth leader for about a decade. So Throw that on the Instagram yeah. bio. Mm, I know. Yeah. That's, I mean, if you put that on a resume, like I hire you, I'll hire you. Like, it's like, you're, you are a junior high youth leader. Done. You can do anything. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You can do anything. So, so spe- speaking oh. of Grant, I wanted yeah. to actually, um, this is all like working perfectly all according to my plan. Oh, all right, plan. man. You're a good interviewer. Oh, Brandon, make me blush. <laughs> speaking of Grant, speaking of Grant, um, he comes to mind, Grant. Alex Hormozzi, uh, yeah. Ryan Pineda, all these cats that are growing up and as they are building their brand, as they are coming on the scene and their online brand and their online presence, they are them. Yeah. Ryan Pineda is the Ryan Pineda show. Alex yeah. Hormozzi just popped up out of nowhere with a beard and a wife beater and said, I'm yeah. worth a hundred million dollars. Listen, yeah, and, er- yeah. and everyone yeah. listens. Yep. There's a lot of creators, myself included right now that are in they see what you've done and they see what grant's doing they see what ryan's doing and they're like okay cool i'm doing big things in real estate but i need i see the power of personal brand i see where this is leaning and where this is heading towards if you were to go back this is the question i've always really kind of wondered about you if you could go back especially in today's climate 
would you hitch your wagon to a bigger pockets to a publication to a hub spot or one yeah. of those publications or would you try to build from scratch as brandon turner if you were to go back yeah i think when you are when you are paid to do something it is way more likely you're actually going to do it i mean in fact mm. the, the, this like it will go back to what I said way earlier about like most of like success is just a mundane, boring thing. So I, I encourage people all the time, especially entrepreneurs. I ask them, what if you did it every single day for six months straight would almost guarantee you success in anything, right? Like if you want to grow yeah. your blog, you want to grow an e commerce like what, if, what action or actions, if you did it every single day without fail, would you almost guarantee you'd be surprised not to get it. So for real estate, it'd be like, if you made an offer every day for six months, I would be shocked if you didn't have one deal, right? Like we'd be shocked. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, come on. Like, that's a lot of offers. So the second part of that question though, is who's going to do that for you? Because I, I, as an entrepreneur, am not good at doing the day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day stuff. I'm just not. I'm not wired that way. You're not wired that way. Most of us that are entrepreneurs are not wired that way. That is why we are entrepreneurs. True. But I was not an entrepreneur. I was not good at it. I guarantee you, I would not have stuck with it had bigger pockets not paid me money to go on a webinar in the beginning and like teach the stuff. Or like, if there was not that, like, this is something I'm doing. Like I, I, I obligate commitment. myself to that. Yeah. It's commitment, right? I am, I am the biggest liar in the world to myself. Like I will lie to myself all day long and not feel bad about it. And I hate that about myself, but I just can't seem to fix it. So instead I just hack my way around it and I say, okay, well, instead for example, if I say I'm going to go on some podcasts because I want to get my name out there and I want to build my brand, and then it comes down to actually doing the work to reach out to podcasters and say, hey, can I be on your show? Or even if somebody asks me to be on the show, I'm like, oh, I don't want to. I'd rather go play video games, right? I will... Instead, I tell my assistant in, a, in like a, a brief moment of clarity, I'll be like, hey, just schedule me on eight podcasts in the next couple of months. Now it's, now it's actually going to get done. Now I'm obligated to get that work done. So to go back to your original question, like I was not a good... Uh, entrepreneur to get that stuff done, nor did I have the skill set to lead others to get those things done. Therefore, I do not believe I would have succeeded without going through the bigger pockets channel first, without being a going through that fire and learning all these things like the boring things matter and how to lead and how to hire and how to fire and how to inspire and all that stuff. I learned through bigger pockets. Would I've done it on my own? Maybe, but I would give it a five percent shot. Hey, doing it through somebody else getting paid to do it, I'd give it like a 90% shot. That's why I love internships. We do so many internships at Open Door Capital because I'm like, like, I want people to get in there and do the work and figure out how it's done and then go do it on their own if they want to or stick with me and make a lot more, hopefully. I love that, man. And, that, and, and that's, I mean, and we all go through different seasons, right? And to that point, right? So Grant had already had some success entrepreneurially yeah. and then Ryan and obviously Alex, like, they were already kind of where they had systems in place and then they just saw the wave and then they were just like, okay, let's get on our boards and ride this thing. Yeah. So that's a, it's a little different because you were still in your process of building yourself to become that architect, which we'll get into in a little bit. Yeah. But I want to go into that about transitioning your mindset from that, that level 10 to that level 100 with Jason. And yeah. I wanted to see if there's kind of like an inflection point. I know you were on stage and you were surrounded by all these people that were doing all this huge stuff. And you were like, okay, I need to get over my fear of raising money, raising capital, all this stuff. You go from Brandon, that's the single family real estate investor to Brandon. That's now employing people for open door capital. What was that transition like? And what was like your biggest friction point associated with that, with hiring your first couple people? Yeah. You know, my favorite movie, if I had to pick a favorite movie, it's probably office space. You remember that movie office space? Like, <laughs> it's like, some like covers Bill on Lumberg. TPS reports. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The TPS reports and Bill Lumberg and all that. Like it, for those who haven't seen it, the movie is about like this like cliche, horrible, like, you know, cubicle work. Like yeah. where you just work for this tech company in a cubicle and it's, you have a boring life and your and bosses are annoying and it's worthless work. That doesn't mean anything. I was so affected by that movie and i was like i do not ever want that and so i maybe rebelled like that's one thing that pushed me towards real estate is i didn't have to have that so then as my real estate started to grow or as i aged and i got older uh the simple revelation became clear to me and i don't know if it was jason durys that said this to me or if it was like in conversation or somebody else did but basically what i realized is as an entrepreneur in order to obtain the freedom that we got into entrepreneurship for, you have to elevate 
your position and your leadership skills. Like it, it's, it's required. I mean, it's very rare to be able to achieve like real big success as an entrepreneur without bringing in people and inspiring them and hiring them and all that stuff. Yet, so I was at this position where I'm like, no, I do not want to be Bill Lumberg. And I do not want to keep working the nine to five of my entrepreneurship where I'm, I'm fixing toilets in the middle of the night for my tenants. Like that was old Brandon was like, do it yourself. I'm that guy. And then there's, I want the freedom that comes with entrepreneurship. And that cannot happen without that mental growth of that mindset shifting. Uh, And so it was hard. In fact, like one of the work I did with some of the work I did with Jason a lot was uh, around the idea of like, management. I kept saying, I don't want to be a manager. I hate being a manager. And then at, at bigger pockets for a while, I got shoved into a management role and I hated it. Like I hated it. Like I didn't get along with the people I was supposed to manage and they didn't like me. And like everyone, like it was, just, it was a really, really rough time. And like, they were all good people. I love everybody at bigger pockets. And like, they were great people. We just, like, it was my, I did not fit. And as a manager, therefore yeah. I said, I don't want to ever do that. And that's what Jason for years worked with me on this idea of like management is not leadership. Leadership is not management. Those can be two separate things. So today, I mean, I've got, I don't know, 60 or 70 employees. I don't do any TPS reports. I don't do any quarterly reviews with them. I don't do any like one-on-ones each week. Like I don't do that stuff because it's different. I'm not a manager. I'm a leader. And that was probably the biggest shift I had to go through over many years. In fact, the phrase that that Jason would use with me all the time is like a, a phrase from like war or like a military phrase. And that is a cadet versus a general. Like I was very much in a cadet mindset for a long time. Like I was on the front lines and I was doing the work and, and he would now, even to this day, he'll ask me, Brandon, is that what a general would do? Because mm. what does a general do in a war, right? A general sits in the back looking over a map. They're strategizing. They're meeting with the president. They're going like, they're going to a fundraiser dinner. Like they're doing like these big high level stuff. They're not picking up their gun and unclogging a toilet with it. Right. Like this is not what they're doing. So again, I did it all wrong. You're telling me, so you're telling me this Mm. entire time while I've been (laughs) unclogging my tenant's toilet. With a gun. Yeah. I show up with my AR-15. Yeah. Yeah, man. You gotta, you gotta get out of that, man. You gotta unclog the toilet with a map. That's what I'm saying. All right. There we go. There there we go. There's the (laughs) title of the episode. No, that's that's fantastic. And I want to get into the business architect role. So talk a little bit about that framework that you came up with, because I literally, I I sent that to everyone when I heard you say that, because let's let's hit about, tell them what the framework is, and then let's go into the logistics of it, because I feel like that's, that's an itch that needs to be scratched from people that were listening. Yeah, man. So this is yeah something I'm super passionate lately on. I've been thinking a ton about it. Maybe someday I'll write a book on it. I don't know. This is how books come out. Is I just start thinking about things a lot. But what I notice is like, you know, Kiyosaki has his quadrants, right? There's like the employee and self-employed, you know, employee, self-employed, business owner and investor. This is not that. Like that's different. That's like your your role in an organization, I guess I, w- I would think of it as. This is more like a mindset thing. And what I realize is it's not cadet or general either. Like there is kind of this idea of cadet in general, but it was more nuanced than that. It was deeper. And, and I wrapped it inside my own story. And here's the two minute nutshell. When I started, I was unclogging toilets and painting every unit. That is what I call the DIY mindset. Now, when I talk about mindset, what I mean is the way you solve problems. That's what mindset means is the way you approach a problem. So the, the when I had a problem, like a clogged toilet, I approached it with the DIY. I will do it myself. Then after a while, I got tired of that, doing it all myself. And so then I thought, well, I'm going to hire someone else to do it. So I hired my like mother-in-law to answer phones. I hired like a local plumber to go out and unplug the toilet. And then I would write the check to the plumber. or I'd even sometimes meet the plumber there and be like, yeah, let me unlock the door for you. Right. So in other words, hate that, that's, that. yeah, I hate that. I hate that role. Right. But it's, I call it the project manager. It's yeah. not like a project manager is like deeply involved, but they're not physically doing the task. They like mm-hmm. the, all the little tasks. Right that's fine for some people. They might love that. And some people might love the DIY, nothing wrong with it. Some people might like project management. I just didn't fit either one. So then the third level, which I I feel like most business books will guide you to be. And that is what I call the COO mindset. It's the idea of I'm going to build a company and the company is going to solve the problem. So I'm going to be the COO or CEO, whatever title you want to put there. Again, this is about mindset, not titles. I'm going to be in charge and around me, I'm going to have employees. So I'm going to have a project manager over here. I'm going to have an acquisitions guy. I'm going to have this one. I'm going to have this one. And you are the center of that kind of like web. 
and the people around you. And that's a great way to run a business. I mean, lo- most business owners would love to get to that level because now at that point, you're not doing much of the day-to-day at all. You're just Groundwork, leading a yeah. team. Yeah, you're just, you're just managing a team. But the key word is you're managing a team. And so even in that role, when I got to that point, I was like, I don't really like this. Like, I don't (laughs) like having six people that report to me and all these like department heads that report to me. I don't care if I'm running the company. I still have to work 40 or 50, 60 hours a week to run this company. That sucks. And yeah, anyway, I I don't want to do that. So I I came up with this like fourth level because I looked at guys like Richard Branson. Richard Branson isn't the CEO or C, I mean, maybe title wise, but he's not running anything. I doubt yeah. he knows half the company he's, he's running. I took my buddy, David Osborne, who started GoBundance. David oh, yeah. Osborne, right? David, like when he buys a company or, or starts a company, he doesn't go hire four VPs and meet with them every week on, and, and, or every day. I'm like, so what is that role? What is that thing that very few people can do? And the way that the best word I can say, I've got two words that I kind of interchangeably use. One is the architect which comes from the matrix our architect in the movie, the matrix was like the guy who got to plan the whole thing. Uh, but like, wasn't in the matrix necessarily. Like he was more like above the matrix. That was like the architect, but really the, the word that I've been using more lately is the energy. Richard Branson energy. is the energy behind the Virgin empire. Uh, David Osborne is the energy behind it. So how does the energy guy, the architect, how do they solve problems? They hire one person. They hire a CEO or they hire a COO, whatever the title is. They hire that one person and say, go build me a business. So the difference being, let me tell you two completing stories and then I'll shut up. Number one, I wanted to build a kite selling business on Amazon. Well, like, this is like six years ago, right? But I thought selling kites, no one does that, but lots of people like flying kites. Why don't we sell them online? <laughs> and I, this, is, this is like pre-open our capital. I was looking for a way to make more money. This is even before I wrote my book. So I was like, I need more like cash coming in. And my rentals, you know, yeah, they make money. But as everyone knows with rentals, like, yeah, it's you a make business. a bunch of money. It's a business and you spend a bunch. And then, oh, you need a new roof and you need a new water heater. Uh, anyway, so I'm like, I need more money. Maybe I'll sell kites. And I had a buddy who was making like a hundred grand a month on Amazon. And I was like, all right. If this guy can do it, I can do it. So anyway, so the first thing I do, I go and hire my little brother. I love my little brother. Very smart guy. Um, I'm like, hey, let me just hire you for a whole year and you run the business. So I was basically acting like a project manager, right? I grabbed him and I made him do it. After like six months, we didn't have anything. We ended up shifting to another product that was like wooden sunglasses. That didn't sell either. After a year and probably $50,000 of lost money, I finally shut it down because I didn't care about any of that stuff. Now contrast that with Open Door Capital. When I started that after that, that conference where I was on stage and I said, I'm going to deserve this, I went and talked to my buddy, Ryan. Ryan, uh, Ryan Murdoch, he's awesome. I worked mm-hmm. with him before on a real estate deal. We had partnered together. I really thought he was a smart dude, but also not just smart dude, but culturally fit and uh, had the experience needed, right? So he had all, all three. He had the, like, he was smart, he had culture and he had the experience. And so I said, instead, Ryan, this is my vision. I'm the architect. This is my vision. Go build it. I mean, I, I, I didn't yell at him to go build it, but I asked him, I was like, what do you think? He's like, I love this. I'm like, go build it. And he's like, yeah. So Ryan, and he went out there. It. Yeah. Go, yeah. And <laughs> Ryan go built build, it. Go, go build it. <laughs> go build it, man. Go build it. He built it. And I didn't have to build it. And so he built it. It was amazing. And so I got to play an architect. I got to cast the vision. I got to see where things are going from a high level. And I get involved sometimes. Like, I'll go do a webinar on when we're trying to raise money for a big real estate deal like we are right now. Like, I'll go do a webinar. I'll go, uh, I, I mean, I don't, I've talked to two investors out of a thousand of our limited partners we have. I've talked to two of them on the phone ever. Uh, and that was like a very rare case. So I don't do most of that stuff. But th- so again, the difference is mindset. So let me throw a, a, like a scenario at you. And then I'll, I promise I'll shut up. You're going to go start a carpet company. You're going to They're go lay carpet. for me, man. <laughs> uh, well, you probably got lots of questions. All right. So you're going to start a carpet laying business, right? Yeah. I'm going to go lay carpet because I think that's going to be a successful business. Great. Nice. The DIYer goes to YouTube and types in, how do I lay carpet? Where do I mm-hmm. buy a knee kicker? How do I get a carpet stretcher? How do I get ads? Uh, who do I, you know, uh, that's what the DIYer says. The next level, the project manager, the project manager says, who can I find to lay some carpet for me? You know, I'm just, I'll probably still take the phone calls, you know, for now, but like, I, I'm, I don't want to actually hurt my knees and get down on my hands and knees and lay carpet. So I'm going to hire these three dudes over here and they're going to come in and lay the carpet for me. That's the project manager level. The third level says, yeah, I think a project, I mean, I think a carpet company would be great. What does that company look like? Well, I would need a VP of sales. I would need a VP of marketing. I would need a, 
uh, a project manager to oversee the construction, or I mean, like the, you know, the crew that lays it, I would need a finance guy and I would need a, whatever, an office building. And mm-hmm. then they go boom and they just build that team. And now they're meeting with their four VPs every day, making sure the work gets done. Nothing wrong with that. But the architect, you know what they do? They go out and buy a carpet company, right? Or, yeah. or they find one dude and they're like, hey, go build me a carpet company. And that guy goes build a carpet company. And, and here's the key, or here's the kind of two super important points about this. Number one, no level is bad. It, it mm-hmm. is not a moral or ethical thing. There's no level that's bad. You might love being a DIYer. Nothing wrong with that. There's areas of my life I still DIY my stuff. This video, this quality video in front of me, I DIY this. It's my camera. I set it up. I like doing this stuff. It's okay. Wow. Right? Great yeah, job, no, Brandon. How- Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, so I like that DIY stuff when it comes to technology. Nothing wrong with that. However, while there's nothing wrong with every level, every level has a limit. Yes. You're not flipping 50 houses a year if you're doing all the painting. You're not going to build a $100 million you know, business when you're answering the phone's customer service. It's just not going to be the case. So every level, the higher you go in the level, the fewer hours are required, but the more money you make. Think about McDonald's. Who makes most money there? The owner. Who works the most? The frontline worker making $9 an hour, right? Mm-hmm. Like those people work the most. They make the least. The person at the top works the the, the highest level mindset works the least, but makes the most amount of money. So that's point number one is every level has a limit. Uh, and point number two, and this is vital, you get to choose where you start. And this is the thing that I wish somebody would have told me 15 years ago, is I assumed that you had to work through this in order to get to the top level. I didn't even know architect existed, but I assumed mm. in order to have a company, you had to start DIY move up, move up, and eventually, you know, hire some people and eventually pull yourself out. That's what everybody does is they say they're going to pull themselves out of their business eventually. But what if, what if you ask the question, how, what if I started this with doing zero work or to pull Tim Ferriss's question from the four hour work week? If you had a gun against your head that mm-hmm. said, you can only work four, four hours, hours a week at this, what would you do? Right. And mm. that's, that just asking that question changes how you think about building a business. And so today, the best way to get into that mindset, the best way to elevate your mindset is a hire the one below you, right? If you want to be a project manager, hire the DIYer, like hire the person who's going to do the work. If you want to be an architect, hire a CEO or a COO, hire your leader. The second way to get in that mindset is to ask yourself WW like EMD or WWBTD, like what would Elon Musk do? Right. Like get that little bracelet, like WWJD bracelets we all had back in the 90s. Like get one of those little yeah. bracelets. But like WW uh, he would, he would tweet about it. He would tweet yeah, about exactly. It. He would tweet about it. But Elon Musk, so Elon Musk actually is probably not the best example because no, he is an architect, example, but he's Brandon. well, he, he's an <laughs> architect, but Elon Musk is probably also every other role because he's a freak and he's probably not human. So yeah. like Elon does all of it. That's he's fair. probably down. Right. Jeff He's Bezos. on the floor. Yeah. Jeff Bezos is a better example. Elon. I mean, um, Richard Branson is probably the ultimate guy I can think of. Perfect. Like what would Richard Branson do if he was going to start a carpet company? <laughs> like he yeah. would not learn how to lay carpet. Like this wouldn't even occur to him. He wouldn't even investigate whether that market had a, a niche. Like if there was a need for it, mm-hmm. somebody else would do all of that for him because he's not now, obviously, you know, you can, you can complain about money and it costs a lot of money to get there, but it doesn't actually. Like it, it's literally mindset and you get to choose. So there you go. Back to you. <laughs> and now for a brief commercial break yeah. <laughs> from Brandon's architect company. There we go. Uh, yes. Let me yeah. tell you for only 29997 I can teach you how to be a. No. Yeah. So that was actually my question, right? So if, if we're being fully candid, like I've got a couple, you know, virtual assistants. So it's like, yeah. I'm, I'm probably still, and even in my real estate, I'm probably still technically, you know, I own the company, but I would still yeah. probably, if we're being honest, calling myself a project manager, sure. right? Yeah. If I got, if like, I've got a handyman, but I have to call him and say, Hey, you need to go yes. out here and do all this. So like, let's not kid ourselves here. My, I get what you're saying because it's, it's David says plant trees, manage orchards, right? Like yeah, that's exactly yeah. what that is. So I feel so what you just said is kind of contradictory to what like I believe and a lot of people listening to this probably believe, which is like, great. Sounds awesome. Once I hit that certain revenue number, I can yes. afford to do that. Like yep. I can get that rock star right now. I don't even know 
what my business, like what I'm doing in my business right now as I'm growing it, sure. let alone what, what the heck does a great CEO look like? Because yeah. I'm figuring out the CEO thing myself. Yep. So my, my question was going to be at what levels do you earn the right to graduate to that next level? But you're saying that you can just simply skate through. So I'm curious, I, any, any tips on this? Cause yeah. you've been through every one of these. Yeah, man. Uh, I think, okay. So first of all, I, I wouldn't consider it skating through in, in that, like, it sounds really easy on paper and on a podcast, it's but simple, to, not easy. Yeah. Right. Yes. But that, yeah. Cause that mindset is something that I developed over 15 years of screwing exactly. up many, many times. Right. I'm just saying now that you hear that and you start asking like, what would Richard Branson do? Like, again, I wish somebody would have told me this, would it have sunk in? I don't know. But like, even on a limited, even a, a, on a small basis, like, let's just say I had no experience and no knowledge. And I wanted to start this carpet business. Like who's to say you can't go out there from day one and try to find somebody, even if, even if that person happens to be your brother-in-law or an intern or some guy at church that you inspired to come work with you to build this, you can still set it up from the beginning and say, no, I'm the visionary. I'm the architect. You're the operator. Like to use, you know, a line from like traction, EOS, which is a, yeah. yeah, EOS, right? Integrator and visionary. Uh, like you can still do that and still play that role. And just when you build your business, just don't build yourself into it. That's really what it is. It's like, we're not, we're like building a house, but we're not going to build ourselves inside the house. We're going to stand outside the house. So like, it's totally possible to do now. Is it easier with money? Yes, of course. You just go out and hire a $500,000 a year CEO to run your company. Yeah, that sounds like a great option. But you know what? When I built Open Door Capital, I didn't even do that. Like Ryan was a partner and made no money. Do you know why he worked for like, for basically no money? He was working for equity. I gave him a percentage of the equity. It's vision, because I right? had... It's because I had the vision and I had the yeah. energy, right? The energy. I actually wrote out my vision and I showed him the vision of where we were headed and how profitable it was going to be. And I was excited about it. And I was like, Ryan, I want to do this with you. Let's do this, man. Like he was like, hell yeah, let's do it. Like I like that's part of the energy. It's that's like huge. Well, this confidence. That's huge though. That's huge. That's huge. So I will... This guy, this guy's going to be so excited that I shout him out. I literally was just talking. So I just met this guy. His name's Connor. Connor. What's shout up, Connor? Out. Shout out, dude. I literally just was on the phone with him. He was calling me asking about Jason Drees coaching. And oh, this guy's like, this guy's like, should I do it? Should I not do it? Like, what do you think, bro? Like, you know, I've got this coaching company and, you know, I'm kind of, you know, nervous. You know, it may go one way or it may go the other. I've got young kids I, and like I'm doing an executive coaching. And I was like, hey, man, I'm going to be like 100% honest and transparent with you. If you are going to coach executives, you need to come with such a God-fearing certainty yeah. and yeah. energy to like with the intensity of a thousand suns. Like yeah. if you want to build this, if you want to build this. And I was like, just the scarcity that you're talking about right now on the phone with me is the reason that you need to do the coaching. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Like, I Connor, agree. This isn't a bad thing. We're not crapping on you, buddy. Like, it's just, it's a perfect example of like a place where you can improve. Cause now with this show, like, I'm like, no one's going to outwork me. Like, I'm yeah. going to take this to the freaking stratosphere because like, yeah. I've got that, how you feel with open door capital is how I feel with this and how I'm going to grow it into a freaking media company. Because yeah. it's exactly like you said, it's not just a podcast. You're thinking, okay, this is everything. Like I can yeah. see all of it in building the architect into it. So I yeah, love man. that. It, there's a great book out there by um, a guy named Ryan Serhant. He's like a real estate agent on like TV, like Bravo or something like that. Anyway, oh, but Ryan guy. has big, a big money energy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's the phrase, I guess the book was, the book was good, but like it's the phrase big money energy. That's what he's getting at. It's like this confidence, yeah. this like vision, this excitement, this energy. And to be honest, it doesn't necessarily have to translate the way that I am talking right now. And you are, we are high energy people, True. but you brought up Al you? Alex Hermosi earlier, right? Yeah, me. <laughs> I don't know. Alex, Alex Hormozzi. For those who are listening who don't know what we're talking about, just type in Children. Alex. Yeah, Hormozzi. H O R M O Z I maybe. Yeah. 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 So he's like, you've probably seen him. He's everywhere. He's blowing up. But the guy yeah. literally sits in his chair, like slouching, and he's like, "Let me tell you how to make a million dollars today." And like that's about the tone he uses. There is yeah. no energy there. Yet, nonchalant. I listen to everywhere. Yeah, very nonchalant. But you just. The word, like the, the big money energy or the confidence, this energy that's there, it's in the actual words he says. Like he's yeah. so good at communicating a really important, valid point that changes lives. 
you don't have to have the energy like I might have, but it definitely doesn't hurt. Like people it's just like ha- the it's the confident. It's the confidence, yeah. but how you how you display yeah. it in your own unique voice. Yep, very much. Okay. Yeah, and, and it doesn't it. come overnight. Like Alex has been doing this for years. Like you watch his early stuff. You watch oh, my yeah. early stuff. Watch your early stuff. Yeah. It develops over time, but it's one of the reasons I like podcasting. This podcast is a good way to you know get better at that energy. Yeah, and that's why I build in public. So while while I did this in the beginning, I was like, okay, cool. I'm not gonna post my download numbers. Like, oh, I made got a thousand downloads this month. Yep. Oh, I got two thousand now, five thousand and ten thousand. And I was like, I'm not gonna originally post that. But then I thought about it, and I was like, why do I care that Brandon's living in Hawaii in a multi million dollar house right now? <laughs> like full transparency, because you would just be a guy like living in yeah. a house. The reason yeah. I care, and the reason people care, is because we knew you when you were living in the states, and you were living mm-hmm. over in, in the other place, and you were like. Yeah, I, crappy Grace Harbor. The, yeah, Grace <laughs> Harbor, dude. Watch, like, we watched you <sighs> grow publicly throughout this. And so we feel like we're part of the journey. So that's why I invite people with me. Oh, that's I'm awesome. like, hey, like build with me. Hey, here's my first $1,000 thousand download month. Hey, now I did it in a week. Hey, now I did it in a day. Now I'm doing 10,000 a day. And like people are growing with me. And so I took that from you, man. I love it. That's for the powerful, sake of man. time, for the sake of time, I want to uh, jump into San Francisco. We just got back. Uh, well, y'all just got back from the Go Abundance Champions. Event. Yeah, yeah. And I've talked to. I just had uh, Cody Bugan on the show. Um, yeah. I was talking to Matt. I was talking to a bunch of guys about it, and they were telling us their outlooks, and it was pretty bleak. So, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, David. Yeah. David was not um, not to sunshine and roses about yeah. where we're going. So while I don't want to say, "Hey, the sky's falling. Uh, we're going to hell in a handbasket." I would like to ask as we close this out, where, what was the conversation like and where, what do you recommend we proactively do as we shift into this new cycle? Because there's going to be opportunity. We just need to figure out how to proactively plan here. Yeah, man. So the short answer is no one really knows what's coming. We're in course, unprecedented, yeah. right? We're in unprecedented, uh, uncharted waters here. Uh, and, and, I think we all see like the, the writing on the wall of what's, what's yep. probably happening, right? Inflation is just cranking up. So the government's going to keep raising interest rates until inflation comes in and, and, and lowers down, which will probably Matt happen. Called. Matt got called what? on his loan for the oh, hotel, really? for the yeah. San Antonio river walk. They, they told yeah. him um, they went up like two points and then they said that he needed to bring like an extra million cash. Dang. Yeah. That stuff, uh, happened we just had a loan the other day that i can't remember the exact details but I, they were going to do like 35 million dollars and so we had raised enough just for that and then at the last second they're like oh you need to bring five more well it was like yeah. the last second we're like well, we already raised the money like last month like what do we like now it just threw everything up into like when well, we figured it out but like i think we're gonna see a lot more of that and as a result i think some people will not be able to handle that uh and so i think we will see opportunities coming up i think we will see more deals um but like what it's, it's impossible to know, but here's what we, you know, it's like when I go out whale hunting, I love this analogy. I go out, well, not actual whale hunting. We call it whale hunting. What it means is you get a paddle board. Yeah. Yeah. uh, yeah, On a paddle board, paddle out in the ocean. Right. And you go look for the whales, but you don't, you don't know where the whales are. You just see them at a distance. You can see the general direction they're heading. And so we just try to head them off, like get, get somewhere in front of them. And then we just know that they're going to pop up somewhere near us. Uh, And then we can correct course to get a little bit closer if we want to, but that's kind of what I say about the, the economy. We can't see at all where the, where the economy is headed, but we can see yeah. the general direction. And we know that interest rates are going up. We know that prices will probably go down a little bit, but inflation doesn't seem to be slowing down, which means rents will probably keep going up. I think most of us under, like follow those basic concepts that rents will probably sure. keep going up. I don't, I don't think anybody really thinks prices. I mean, not like the mainstream doesn't think prices are going to tumble. I don't think we're going to see, you know, 50% off deals like we did years ago. No. Uh, and there's just so many people who still want to buy right now that it's kind of eaten up all the inventory, even as prices rise. But, uh, I mean, the main takeaway, I guess you you just get from groups like GoBundance is yeah, things are changing. That's when millionaires and billionaires are created. That's when all the wealth is created and it's given to people who are not afraid. People who are, are actively, you know, looking at where they're at all the time, but also not afraid to take some risks. Who are not afraid to see what's moving and, and how they can capitalize on it, and all are also being careful about what they do. So, uh, it's it's a crappy answer to say I don't know, uh, and and nobody else does either. Other than that, we're at, we're in for some trouble ahead. But I personally do not believe it's going to be anything like 08. I don't think we're going to see that again. 
anytime soon. Yeah, I don't think so either. So you're um, so like right now, like I'm sitting, I'm sitting pretty heavy in cash. Like, yeah. It, well, also I'm about to go travel around the world for a year. So I mean, that also like that impacts helps. that a little sure. bit. Yeah. So, <laughs> but like that's that's just my prerogative right now is I kind of want to sit. But like personally, is that something that you're doing as well? I mean, I know you're using obviously you have the company and you're putting investor funds. You're still actively investing, but like personally. Are, are you being a little bit, you're like just sitting on the sidelines a bit? What are you doing with your own portfolio? Uh, I wouldn't say sit on the sidelines. I'm definitely trying to save more cash. Uh, that said, I don't like a lot of, it's a balancing act, right? Cause a lot of cash is getting devalued by inflation. Sure, so sure. I want to have some cash. Um, what I'm, I'm doing though is I'm buying real estate, right. That I think yeah. will hedge this better than almost any other asset class probably. So I'm buying real estate, even like I bought a second home. Uh, I bought, uh, you know, we're buying a ton. We're buying more apartments now than I think we've ever bought total combined up until now. So I should end the year at like over half a billion of real estate. And so we're buying a lot. That said, like we're not getting 80% loans. We're deliberately choosing 60, 65% uh, loan to value. Some more equity. So yeah, more equity. We're raising more money than we probably need to because we want to ensure that whatever happens, we can withstand it. Like it's not like the, the crappy thing with real estate is like, uh, you know, you can do a right for 10 years and then the 11th year you do something stupid and you lose everything you just built up for 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's the danger of just fi finances in general. So we got to make sure that we don't ever hit that like loss year. And uh, that's that's what we're doing now, so. Yeah, I think the difference at the end of the day, what's going to wipe people out is um, operations. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's not necessarily going to be like, yeah, there's going to be some deals that fall to the wayside because people are, are like, they're getting caught on these loans that they've already like agreed to with the bank, but then it's going to be these operational companies that are just, they're just not what they said they were. Like, yeah. I think that's where the opportunity is going to be. Cause these, like, it, I think it's going to be a lot in the multifamily space. They're not going to be able to hold these assets. Yeah, so I agree. I'm, I'm curious to see. And then um, time-wise, you want to go ahead and shut it down? You got it. Cool, brother. I got, so, I got, I got eight minutes. Got eight minutes. Yeah, I got eight minutes. All right, everyone, you heard it here first. Brandon's got eight more minutes. <laughs> we got it, brother. I love it. Talk, talk a little bit. Um, let's hit on this briefly because this is something that you said forever ago, and it kind of got buried in the in the podcast vault. But uh, are you still actively doing your strategy for Rosina Wilder with the rental properties? Yeah, uh, I am. So for those who haven't heard, what I did is when Rosie was born, I bought a four unit property, I burned it. So I bought it, rehabbed it, rented it out, refinanced, got my money back out, most of it. And then uh, we just held it as a rental property. That property, I still own it today. It still makes over $1,000 a month in cash flow every month. But it is set to be paid off. I have it on a payment, like I structure the payment so that it would be paid off when she's 18. She's six right now. So in 12 more years, it'll be paid off. The idea when I bought it was, look, if I can pay this off in 18 years, it should be worth, I bought it, you know, I bought it for like 50. I put a hundred into it roughly. So I've got 150 into it. I was like, okay, well, this should be worth about $300,000 when she's ready for college. It'll probably double between, you know, over those 18 years. Now in reality today, like the market went crazy and now it's worth like 400 today, which is awesome. Oops. Uh, yeah, but it just shows the power of real estate that like I didn't even have to make the cash flow. Cash flow is great, but if you just buy a property for your kid when you're when they're young, like not even for the like it just buy it with your own money or do burr house hack. I don't care. Just get the property and then like earmark it in your head as this property is this kid's property. Put it on a 15-year mortgage or whatever and then pay it off. At the end of it, you can either sell it or refinance it. And it cut you'll have hundreds of thousands of dollars for your kid. So for Rosie, this is exactly what I did. I I bought the property. Um, and you know, we owe a hundred grand left on it, something like that right now. And it'll be paid off when you go to college. And by then it'll probably worth a million dollars because inflation is crazy with wilder. I did something a little different mm -hmm. with that with wilder. I just took 50 K like just $50,000 that I had. And I put it into my own fund, like open door capitals fund, <laughs> nice. because if I can, yeah, I said, no, we, we try, we aim for like, you know, uh, mid to high teens for teens percentage. The I would IRR, love, right. Yeah. yeah. I would love to get 15, 18, 20% IRRs. Like we we're we, that's what we want. I just projected up. If I could just maintain 11% over the next 15 years for wilder, I'd have about the same amount without, without the headache. Right. Cause like, like not that there's a lot of headache with that rental that I have with Rosie, but there's some, like we have to deal with things and things break sure. and I'll have to put on new roofs eventually. But if I can just put 50 K in, uh, it should be worth about 300 K when Wilder's ready to go to college. So I'm doing the same thing. I just did two different approaches. Now 
one of the reasons I did this is because of one, I can tell other people like on the show right now about this topic, they can choose which avenue works for them. Sure. But B, like I get to teach Rosie and Wilder about the real power estate. about real estate, the power of financial freedom and, 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 and assets versus liabilities and all that. And so from like Rosie knows she owns a property. Wilder doesn't, he's not, he's only two. He doesn't know what's going on, but Rosie knows it's her property. We drive by it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I know. Come on, kid. Uh, <laughs> but Ro- Rosie gets it. And so in the next couple of years, as she gets into like first, second grade, she'll be doing math when she gets into math. The math she'll be working on every month and every week is going to be her own rental property. She's going to learn how to run a profit loss statement, all that throughout the next 15 years of her life. She's going to be so good at real estate because she had real world experience. Uh, and that's what I'm most excited about with that. Uh, I love how uh, I love how Thatch does that with his kids, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Teaching yeah, your kids them. is so valuable. Yeah, that's that's freaking awesome, man. And I, I love that. And somebody I posted that and somebody like was arguing with me about that. And he was like, well, I can get I can just put my money in into the market and then do yeah. this. But then here, here's like a, another caveat. I'm like, well, first off, you completely like it was an infinite amount of money because it's an infinite return. You got your money back. You yes. burned it. Also, what if your kid was positioned to go to college this year? Yeah. You know, in the stock market. Like you would yeah. be like, whoa, you're not going yep, to Harbor. Yeah, yeah. You're going, yep, you're going to have to wait going, a few years. Go to Grace Harbor community. <laughs> like, exactly, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, brother, this has been this has been freaking awesome, man. Uh, I've been, well, thanks, uh, dude. been a huge fan. You're one of the ones that inspired me to make this show. And now it's uh it's like at that mark. Like things happen when they're supposed to happen, not before or after. And I know that you and I were messaging back and forth like six months ago about coming on, but it, this was yeah. the time. We made it happen, man. Because now it's just going gangbusters and it's so much fun. And I just did what you said, man. Every single week, I'm clockwork. Every it week, is. I don't miss. Like, you this is the rhythm, my man. Thing. Exactly. As we finish up, what is this is going to be a difficult one for you? Uh, mm. What is one thing that you are very proud about in your life or business that most people don't know about you? Oh, man. I told you. Oh, that people don't know about me. That's a hard one. Uh, huh. Uh, let's go. Like, I, I would say, like, it, uh, people know about it on this podcast that I mentioned earlier, but I don't really talk about it. The, the years of being a junior high youth pastor, youth leader, um, that that made me a lot of who I am today, I think. Mm. Uh, and it's really, and I got no money for it. There's never any, I mean, it was all volunteer and you go through, a, I mean, junior hires go through a lot of crap, a lot of like their friends commit suicide and all these like just really tough things. So I'm pretty proud. I stuck with that for 10 years. So I'm going to go years, with that one. Wow. Yeah. 10, 10 years. I did that. Man, that's awesome. Well, there we go. Yeah. Now everyone learned a new thing about the beard. There you go. There you yeah. go. The reason this podcast was so good, this podcast is brought to you by the power of flip flops. I'm go. wearing mine right now. So, Brandon, <laughs> so me and Brandon can communicate telepathically. Oh, it's a good, that's it how it's done. Way. That's how it's done. I actually <laughs> yes, am, I'm barefoot right now because I'm in my house, but I've been wearing them all day, man. Oh, I, I trust me. I know it. The, the flip flops and jeans king. But uh, Brandon, I appreciate Dude, it, my thank friend. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. This has been that six foot six Hawaiian guy and Brian with the (laughs) action Academy podcast signing off.